Hello, welcome to the Spaceship Earth Mission Log podcast. I'm here with Felicia Chavez from the Mission Cooperating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Welcome, Felicia. Thank you. And so we all know Felicia from Space Camp because uh, she worked at the Buckminster Fuller Institute for a while and has just moved on. And so we're very grateful for her time there. And, you know, you've obviously had her in your email. And so um, I'd like to um, start by asking about the mission. So this was your first Space Camp and you were leading a mission. And it's a mission that's, I guess, this uh, cooperating manual has been a project for a long, long time. So you kind of pick something up in the middle. And uh, so just tell me a little bit more. Who were your collaborators and what did you have to tackle and what were you able to, you know, what were you able to, to suss out at this, at this point in the process? Yeah, for sure. Well, so um, my collaborators, um, I would, I, I, I'm not the best with names. Even when I recall people's names, then I like forget them. There's something in my brain. I will never be a politician probably because of <laughs> that <laughs> handicap with names. But I do remember, um, let's see. So Mark Smith, um, he was definitely involved in the cooperative manual mission for this space camp, um, the climate uh, space camp Um and he actually, I would say, has more experience with the cooperating manual than I because he was around in the years past as a member of BFI, as a participant in space camps, participating in the various, um, you know, like design charrettes and brainstorming sessions and meetings of, of organizing, trying to kind of pull together what would the cooperating manual project look like. Mm -hmm. um, so he was part of our conversations and um, also... Um, Benta, uh, I think her last name is Miller. I'd have to look it up again, but she's, she's in, um, Sweden. I think it is, maybe it was Denmark. I can't remember. Um, and she's, uh, also, you know, kind of have the, she has a mission as well. Have you interviewed her about her mission? I haven't yet. Yeah. Yeah. So her mission was really interesting having to do with sort of VR and, um, these other things in relationship to world game. And, you know, mm -hmm. what would the new world game today look like, given all this, you know, sort of off the shelf technology potentially that we have access to. And so her and I so much more rich extent. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of what her mission was about and what this mission was about. Um, and then we had other people just kind of pop in and, and collaborate and contribute over the weeks of Space Camp. And uh, we had one person who uh, contributed kind of a user interface profile of the existing website and then. Mm. Uh, for, for various reasons, we couldn't do a full overhaul of the um, website, which is currently hosted on Squarespace. But um, we did incorporate, to the best of our ability in the short term, some of her input to make it just a little bit more user friendly. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, a few other people who, who just would pop in when they could. Uh, you know, the nature of, of Space Camp is such that people are able to either participate in live sessions and mission meetings or watch recordings later and then participate on the forum in Slack. So um, mm -hmm. That's kind of what it you also like. had Nikki Wall, who was uh, editing a lot of entries, right? So Nikki was really key um, and still is actually because she's continuing to um, shepherd the resources that people input into this to the cooperative manual database. Um, so yeah. she went into the Airtable database and kind of worked it out. And her and I met a few times, and she worked out how you know what the sort of previous schema was and then making notes going forward because oftentimes people resubmit something or there's a, a duplicate or there's a main url and then a sub url or you know so she worked she spent hours and hours working through all of that and happily is still um to this day <laughs> sort of working it's so on much work shepherding this. it's so much to maintain it's so and much work. i think of the goal of something like i i think you had mentioned in the mission profile that you uh, you see the, the the idea kind of like people reaching for a whole earth catalog kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. me, I feel like ultimately something like that would be stewarded by a group of collaborators and editors, kind of the way that Wikipedia is, 
but mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more like a you know a certain select circle of people that are able to collaborate and contribute. But in order to do that, you have to have a robust platform. And you know, I think you're kind of working with what you have at this point. And six weeks is not a lot of time to make mm-hmm. massive changes. So I know that you guys did some work on the usability aspect of the website itself, um, how it draws your attention to the resources, how it invites you to um, look for things or search for things, uh, where those you know, uh, indicators are located and also, uh, you know, an invitation to collaborate to get people to submit resources, but to do it in a way that's not that's going to reduce duplicates and extra work. Um, So, you know, real real design design challenge, design centric process that it seems like you were all in for this period of time. Yeah. And, you know, as as you mentioned at the beginning, I um, I kind of stepped into the Cooperative Manual project. I, I joined BFI in October of 2021 and as part-time person. And um, so I, I, I sort of tried to pick up the Cooperative Manual project, but you know, with my part-time status and two other jobs, I couldn't really contribute that much. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, I when the when the space camp came around and I hadn't participated in a space camp officially in the past, it did give my, me the opportunity to sort of put my head into. So what really is the Cooperative Manual Project? What does it look like? Who's contributed to it? What are our um, assets and liabilities, as it were? Yeah. Uh, and so I quickly realized that you know, I'm probably part of my attraction to it is the fact that it it sort of echoes, you know, you referenced the whole earth catalog, it it references or echoes these other projects that I've seen literally over at least 20 years, um, that are attempts to help if to borrow from theory, you help the system to become conscious of itself. So that was Mm -hmm. the beauty of the whole earth catalog is it did that It, it performed that function. Um, and I'm sure there's other examples as well, but that's kind of the go to in this BFI world. Um, nevertheless, what the pattern that I've seen over time is that these types of initiatives for whatever reasons don't work in the longer term. Everybody says they want the modern equivalent of the whole earth catalog and it kind of just doesn't work. And we're not entirely sure why. I think that a real effort would be required to, to interview people in depth. Like for example, um, Wiser Earth was a great example of a phenomenal idea that somehow didn't work. And Mm -hmm. maybe that maybe that set of reasons is similar to why some of these other projects haven't worked or maybe different. I don't know because I've I've not looked into that particular project myself. But um, just for those of you who don't know, it was an initiative on the part of a group associated with Paul Hawken. When he talked about it, I would heard I would hear him talk about how he had been around the world and you know, all these times speaking on various books and initiatives and projects and collected gajillions like suitcases full of business cards. And so why not put those into a database so we can all kind of find each other? (laughs) Makes perfect sense. Everybody goes, yeah, great idea. And then it somehow doesn't work. And I I saw a similar initiative at the Bioneers Institute at one point, this like database so we can all see each other and check it out. It looks so cool and cutting edge technology. And then like, crickets, like never heard of it again. And I myself was a sort of intern slash employee at two different initiatives that were supposed to do something very similar. One in the LA area um, in 2008. I can't remember. No, wait, 2000. Yeah, I think it was 2008. And it didn't work. Um, And then another one up in the Bay Area um, that I think they actually had like the whole earth catalog, like IP or something like they had like bought the brand or something. Um, and it was a really cool idea and they had this and they had that and it was really fun and it was enthusiastic and they was and it just never really flew. Um, yeah. and so again, I'm sure there's commonalities across these different instances. I myself as part of systems thinking Marin, my nonprofit that just wrapped up at the end of last year created S D G Marin.org for sustainable development goals or sustainable mm-hmm. development goal, sdgmarin.org, which is, it was, I really went into it like, okay, this is just going to be Marin and it's going to, it's going to be a demo. It's not going to be an exhaustive, complete catalog of all of the organizations in Marin County associated with number one, no poverty or number two, zero hunger or number three, good health and well being. It's just going to be a demo. So like a few in number one, a few in number two, a few in number three. And so 
So I found some help to create that kind of somewhat built out demo. Um, but I knew from having seen this pattern over time that it was, it was, it was way more to sort of, you know, chew than, than would make sense for me to bite off as one, a little one person nonprofit entity under a fiscal sponsor with a limited budget. Um, yeah. And so now also, I want to say though, that I've also seen this in other areas, um, not just in the world of, of sustainability at large. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've seen it, you know, uh, let's see, I think there's somebody named Greg Bloom, if I got his name correctly, um, who's worked on a protocol so that f- uh, specifically for providers of social services, they can, in a clean way that protects data, nevertheless, share information across databases. So if you're a food kitchen supplying meals, you can send your clientele, essentially the people who are coming to, re- to be recipients of your services oh, to great. the dental van yeah. or to the place that's going to help them with their resume or the place that's going to supply them with some leads on housing or, Brilliant. you know, it's like a, it's a referral database. Right. Um, that's kind of where it grew out of. But then it turned also into more of this, um, you know, uh, there's a there's a company called Benetech in the San Francisco Bay Area that at least for a while, I don't know how the project is going, but it experimented with, okay, we have all these clinics across the Bay Area that are not sharing information and we're all spending money, serious money on databases and people to manage those databases and collect the same information over and over and over uh-huh. again from different individuals, wasting tons of money, tons of time. Why can't we share resources? Uh, why can't we share information across people, across organizations, so that we all can spend more money helping people rather than on administration? Right. Um, and so that was based on this, you know, sort of protocol of like, how do we in a clean and, and uh, you know, secure way, share people's private information too across organizations. Yeah. Um, but it's that sharing piece that it brings us back around to the cooperative manual where, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, four or 500 entries of different um, projects, books, films, websites, articles that all have to do with sort of making the world a better place. Yeah. And in all likelihood, every single one of those is in multiple places across the web and this database and that database are not talking to other to each other or that database or that database. So it's like we're all these disparate manually typed in databases. <laughs> well, and more importantly, if I'm like scrolling my phone and I'm going, you know, like the, the, the if I'm thinking about something, it's because something, you know, reminded me of it. And if mm-hmm. or I see something and then I go down that rabbit trail. So like if I'm not thinking about going to cooperating manual dot live, then I am not interacting with it you know there may be tons of resources and here i am looking for something in particular but i don't think to look at this database because it's not somewhere i go uh i go to facebook every day and so whatever comes to me on facebook that's what i (laughs) that's what i'm aware of because it's feeding me all these things and and so i think some of the big data companies have been really good about getting you to a certain place and then you know there's all these different places that it can take you from there uh but when you're dealing with a database you have to know what you're searching for Mm -hmm. i think all this is a really really uh, excellent conversation because I've noticed the same thing, and it reminds me of the early days of Yahoo, when Yahoo was a web directory, and basically it was a curated, like, you know, you'd go under a category like, um, like, uh, what would you say, like, um, just pick a category. Sports. Sports. (laughs) Thank you. And so you go to sports and then there's a list of like a breakdown of sports by by sport and by city. And there you go. And by country, blah, 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 blah. And it's cure. And pe- and I think what happened was that quickly um, you the, the world realized that or these tech companies realized that people are making things because there's so many people there's making things faster than you can catalog it. And so quickly Yahoo jumped off of. Um, the um, like directory, like um, phone book style of doing things. And they moved to just uh, like, we're going to just web spider and we're just going to have, you know, you search for all the things based on the keywords and you just get what you get. And then Google took it a step further and said, we're going to build an algorithm that can help to like make sense of all this and help bring you more relevant results. And so what we've kind of ended up in is, is this world 
not just of algorithms, because, you know, Netflix knows what you might want to watch, and that's a big part of it. But also, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's where your attention is. Those are the things you tend to, you know, cluster around in your mind. Like, you know, you think of, uh, you think of, French toast and you think of breakfast and you think of all the other things you could have for breakfast and all the good breakfast places that you like to eat at or that you might want to eat at. And, and, and so like if I say if I say breakfast, your mind goes to a, a set of things and you may explore a little bit outside of that if you're feeling brave, but breakfast is breakfast. <laughs> so I think that's part of the challenge uh, when designing something like this is, you know, we talked about this in Lauren Menace's interview, uh, the problem of siloing. I mean, basically, we have so many people, and if, if, if there are two different networks and people are working on the same problem, chances are you're not going to know about what the other team is working on, or even maybe your goals are slightly different than these goals, but a solution that comes out from this group that this group needs. And, you know, like you said, how do we share information? How do we become aware of all the things there are to know? And the short answer is we can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible. Um, but, you know, we can try. And I certainly think that um, what's amazing about the cooperating manual is how many great resources there are that are listed there and how it is bringing it together one place. And a microcosm of that was your email signature. I went through and I realized that you're a part of five different initiatives that, you know, it took me time to just go down each one of them. And that's just you. That's just one person. And so when you when I look at, you know, how much talent there is in the Space Camp community, the Buckminster Fuller community at large, we're all polymaths and we all have so many different things going on. And it's like how to you know how to streamline that how to get you know people to people to resources and resources to people and people to each other and yeah well yeah and i feel like you you know in, in what you were just saying it's kind of moved us up to sort of the more a more meta level essentially of um this whole question you know, where it's like sort of down here in terms of a specific initiative, the cooperative manual is a present day example of one attempt to do something that we've seen basically fail <laughs> over 20 years <laughs> and probably more. Um, and, and yet we still have the same impulse. And, you know, I've, I've mentioned this in, in other places, but that, in fact, I think I have a blog entry about this on Systems Thinking Marin, but um, I've, I've heard this refrain again and again and again across, you know, issue areas where you're at a meeting and at some point somebody sits back and says, I just, I just wish we knew who was doing what. And it's that very simple sort of wish that I think mm. is behind all these impulses that was behind Whole Earth Catalog and, you know, behind these different attempts to do something similar um, that I just wish we knew who and is behind, you know, theoretically behind media. Um, and news media, but unfortunately, unfortunately, news media. <laughs> um, Double yeah, face so, bomb, Riker yeah. and Picard at the same time. <laughs> yes, and so, and this this really quickly quickly gets into the you know sort of systems thinking proper. Good. Which for me, I follow the work of Danella Dana Meadows, and I I use as a jumping off. Point for a number of the blogs and also for the book that I'm just finishing up. Um, her point about asking the question, what is the purpose of the system? Mm. And it can be kind of any system and it's purpose slash function slash goal. I'd almost say almost even motivation. Um, right. And and it's it's really key and she points out in her book, Thinking in Systems, a primer, that you you can't really, you're mistaken to believe what members of the system tell you when we're talking about human systems, mm -hmm. that their purpose is. Because oftentimes you, you don't really know, even when you're in the system, even when you're high up in the system, you don't necessarily really know. And oftentimes you might sort of recite the mission statement but mm -hmm. she specifically says you have to stand around for a while and watch what the system actually produces. Right. That tells you what its purpose is. Mm. And, you know, we often find ourselves sort of saying the system is broken or whatever, but other people sort of retort the system is doing what it was designed to do. 
Mm-hmm. And to some extent, that's accurate. And I would say in some ways it's inaccurate because oftentimes, you know, because we're all, you know, sort of swimming in systems nested in systems. And oftentimes we sort of inherit the purpose accidentally. Um, yes. And so in this book that I'm, um, I'll, I'll give you a little visual of, I just got this in the mail, my dear Marin. <laughs> Yay, um, your book. The subtitle is, can Marin County reach the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of 2030, a systems thinking perspective? And so it's based on the first six United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of 2030 um, from a systems thinking perspective, looking at a lot of research. You know, I have a lot of citations of other of reports from various um, entities. And, you know, so to take the example of Marin County, where I recently moved from, the question would be something like, what is the purpose of Marin County? And to answer that, uh, you would need to stand around for a while and watch, well, what does Marin County produce? And of course, Marin County sadly produces, um, sadly or not so sadly, depending on your perspective, a nice place to live for relatively wealthy individuals and families. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's challenges that come with that, such as traffic, because mm, people who yes. work in Marin County to provide services to the relatively wealthy individuals and families in Marin County have to drive in for more affordable places. Um, right. Part of the issue also is in a disaster, your, your low lying facilities might be underwater or corrupt mm. in some way. And those people are gonna have to drive in to attend to those. And, um, you know, so there's just like, there's, I mean, we could go on and on about the problems associated with, um, having a whole entire county be kind of okay if you're making $150,000, $200,000 a year and more yeah. and, and how that creates, you know, downstream issues. But we're in, in, in sort of inherited a sort of um, what it's doing to some extent informed by its surrounding counties and the state and the nation and the global market economy. And so, um, yeah. So how, how would you retool that? And, and then even if you did decide here in Marin County, we are going to find a way to make our purpose human well-being. Well, that asks a lot of everybody. Yeah. Um, and it comes back to your point about like, well, you know, or in the, and that I wasn't making too about like who's doing what and, mm-hmm. and, and, and how is it going? What are they up to? How can I help? Um, because to really do that, that uh, our purpose is going to be human well-being, you would need to understand and see visibly who is doing what. And, and to come back to this sort of, what for me comes back to databases, whether we're talking about the Cooperating Manual or SDG Marin or you know any of these other things. There's, from my perspective as a community organizer in Marin, there were three target markets. One was just the person off the street who needs to know when the clinic is open because mm-hmm. they need to go to the medical clinic yeah. or any number of other services that they might require. Um, there's the professional care provider, the person who's trying to get people to take advantage of CalFresh food assistance programs. And right. they're you know coming up with all kinds of ideas and brainstorming and tabling and mailing and emails and attending meetings and trying to get the word out. Like, look, if you're if you're eligible for Cal- for CalFresh, please apply because not only does it help you and your family, it also helps the local economy because these dollars that Marin does not get, we don't get. And so it doesn't feed our local yeah. economy. And yet the program, the federal money, the state money, whatever it comes from is available. So we need to take advantage of that. And then there's the community organizers. And that was the seat I was in where it's like this, how do we see who's doing what, how it's going and how I can help. And it's just yeah. that really simple. But that little set of questions that seem fairly straightforward and like not that esoteric. And I see people stumble across those same same questions and articulate them again and again and again across issue areas over time. A society whose purpose is something like profit and growth, Mm -hmm. those questions aren't really that interesting. They're not germane to the purpose of profit and growth. And so unless and until those questions are germane to the purpose of the society at large, you're really going upstream trying to uh, 100%. You know, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, because still, uh, you're again. What is the purpose? Uh, you know, or what is the inherited uh, set of circumstances? Is that if you if you live in Marin, you're in that upper echelon of income, which means that you're in a certain kind of job. You're in more of an information or uh, intelligentsia kind of role. And so that also in our society is segmented to believe, well, that means that you're not doing your own uh, community things. You're, you know, you're a specialized worker. You're, you're here to, to provide information, knowledge, services. And so that means we don't want you doing all this. Other. So we're going to import that labor and they can't afford to live here. And, and, and so you, you end up with this non-systemic thinking, non-holistic way of doing things. These people do this, these people do that. And I, it makes me think of the disaster situation. Like, what if so, What if the people who do the basic things can't get to your community? Then all of a sudden, you're going to have to learn how to pick up a shovel, which is kind of what I see people getting back to in a lot of these more like um, the urban homesteading type environments where it's like, hey, let's return to a life where we're we're kind of doing a more well-rounded version of living, a whole human, whole nature, you know, whole like to and it kind of it kind of goes to something that you um, that I was picking up on with the operating manual for Spaceship Earth, where he talks about how specialization became a very useful tool for empire uh, because they talked about the pirates who were, he talked about the pirates who were basically figuring out how to like, okay, if we have all the information and we can get all the resources from here to there and, you know, uh, then specialization was a way to keep people from seeing the real whole picture or like being a competitor to that, you know, sort of snatch up all the resources game. And it's not that specialization is bad, but it's it, it does really limit you. And you brought this up in goal three when you were talking about healthcare. It's like we, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. And part of the reason for that is, is that we're not actually looking at the whole healing process and all of the mysterious things that happen in the body that we don't understand. We're just looking at the lungs or the liver or, you know, the foot or, you know, it's all this separation in uh, specialties. And so what you end up with is a myopic view of everything. So as you said, if we're not looking at the underlying principles of, you know, our wealth economy, then we're not going to understand why the the lowest um, on the, the chain aren't a priority. It's just, it's like, okay, we have to manage this enough so we don't have, you know, homeless all over the streets. Let's just make sure that there's not mass illness everywhere you know because we want our area to be nice and and that's that's informing the priorities and no one would say that out loud but that's the implication of what happens because of you know like you said it's you know goes back to the the uh, forms of wealth you know (laughs) when we're only looking at one you know money finances as the only um as the only piece of the holistic puzzle it leaves out everything else that Ultimately, if you have no water, if you have no air to breathe, then it doesn't matter how much money you're making. Like, none of that matters. If your house is underwater, it doesn't matter how much money you're making. You know, and that's that's the thing that I think the systems thinking approach gives us this ability to zoom out and look at life in a more... Not necessarily to understand everything, but to to recenter our search, you know, in a way to like sort of, you, you know, and it's it's wonderful to encounter that kind of it's refreshing to encounter that kind of thinking of like, no, like what's going on here isn't because people intended for bad things to happen. It's because. A human thing is to not notice or question, what are we building? (laughs) Like, what is this for? (laughs) Yeah. And um, yeah, there's something you said that kind of pinged something else, too, that it's 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 a i mean there's it's a it's a whole lot of of different potential directions but um i i really appreciate in thinking in systems a primer danella meadows talks about that when you're a systems thinker you don't blame individuals rather we blame systems (laughs) 
for all intents and purposes. <laughs> and um, and so on the one hand, that kind of helps to de-escalate. Like, uh, yeah. you know, she there there's there's a lot of finger pointing. There's a lot of blaming. There's just so much of that. And and, you know, we can see why. But I mean, honestly, it's immature. It's 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 there's a lack of intellectual maturity there when you find yourself finger pointing and blaming, which, of course, I find myself doing that as well, because we fall into it just really quickly. Um, but it's it, it belies a lack of, of insight, of attentiveness to really what's going on. Um, and I'm using this word maturity um, because we fail to recognize the forces at work uh, that mm. are propelling what appear to be individuals doing diabolical things yes. um, in here in in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we're currently temporarily located. And I say temporarily because the um, the air pollution from the steel mills is is really significant mm. here. And uh, that is not something we knew about before we got here. Although if we had done a Google search for um, <laughs> air quality Pittsburgh before deciding to land here, then that would have tipped us off. But in any yeah. case, then you add on top of that the train disaster that was basically an hour and 15 minutes from here in East Palestine oh, that looks yeah. like a little town, but it's an hour, an hour and 15 minutes from Pittsburgh. And I mean, talk about a freaking disaster. And I have yeah. not studied that issue. I haven't been reading the articles. I've just been kind of hearing from my partner in passing and from others and headlines that you know, the, the company in charge of the railways you know, gave out gajillions of dollars in dividends or, you know, value to shareholders as opposed to attending to the safety and basically health of the rail system and the employees mm. and not to mention the counties and towns that the trains run through. But, um, yeah, this piece about, about, you know, sort of who's responsible, it's, it's, it is more of a what than a who. And yet, mm -hmm. at the same time, equally, those who's have to participate actively and sort of um, uh, engage actively and increase their level of awakening and active participation. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, what happens is you behave in these sort of aut automatic ways yes. that are influenced by the system in which you're embedded. And that... Um, that is very actually very leaky i would say it it the the human spirit doesn't show up when you're asleep in that sense of of your quality of consciousness it only shows mm -hmm. up when you engage and yeah. unfortunately we've got all these corporations and government entities that are essentially running the world and yeah. they're basically i mean just like hello anybody anybody there you know you really get the feeling and i love this part of um Danella Meadows book where she says, we look at these entities and we think their purpose is profit and growth. And that's what I tend to say. But she mm -hmm. says, if you look more closely, you start to see that really what's happening is they're trying to reduce uncertainty. Yeah, and that's a really powerful kind of insight to start to see what's really going on here. Is this quest to reduce uncertainty. And so it kind mm -hmm. of begs the question, what's so special about certainty? And then what's so special about uncertainty? <laughs> um, yeah. Because systems and life, that's the that's the arena of 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 abundant uncertainty. And right. thank goodness it is without that we would be dead pretty quickly. But yeah. that uncertainty, that nonlinearity is is the realm of of life and fecundity and amazingness yes. and makes it worth being alive whereas yes. that control piece i mean again you can see why you know there's all these pressures on people to conform to perform to mm -hmm. um to increase the profit margin to look like they are the the fancy pants know what they're doing kind of person at the top you know yep. And it's just this bizarre, archaic impulse. But again, you can kind of see how people get caught up in that. It's just well, in your your yeah. Once you get into that that corporate 
ladder climbing it is it is linearity it's a ladder and there it, it's a whole culture and it's a whole set of uh, of assumptions and values that it's almost like a value meme it, it gets inherited by whoever's in the role to perform the role well you need to know the system and work within it and you don't question it you know you might not like it they might not be a hundred percent on board with it but if you want to succeed then that's what you're going to do and I love that piece about non-linearity and actually where you said, um, uh, yeah, non-linearity versus linearity. I think what it comes down to is the idea of seeing things as interwoven and interconnected, uh, you have to have a certain amount of tolerance for uncertainty. And that can be messy sometimes, but it also is what nature comes from. It's it's what everything arises from. And so there's this desire in Western society to sort of make everything fit neatly on a calendar, make everything fit neatly in a box on a on a ledger and you know to be able to account for everything every variable uh carl welty and i were talking about this measure everything <laughs> when you make art make it literal like this is a literal like you know uh, you could you could take a scale model of this drawing and it will look like reality if you're at this single point and that's just not reality and i think you know systems are messy and People are messy, and the world is messy and beautiful at the same time. And so for that to arise, you know, you're, you're trying to impose order. And, I mean, I guess that is kind of the, the broader question, right? You know, I mean, we do want that certainty of safety, and you're trying to impose order on something that inherently doesn't have it. And there is always going to be some loss arising from that imposition of order it's just a matter of who does it benefit and what what outcome are we trying to design for right yeah and you're just reminding me i just finished reading bono's memoir or autobiography titled surrender and cool. uh, in fact i have a i think i have it i can give you a visual here Way cool. And you can kind of see the like, you know, nonlinearity of the, the layout. It's pretty punk book. rock. <laughs> it's very punk rock. Um, but this this aspect of surrender, because when we start to talk about certainty versus uncertainty, we're actually talking about pretty profound, really central, um, I don't know, central organizing principles in mm -hmm. terms of what we organize our lives and our worldviews around. And whether we're close to and trying to um, control, basically, factors such that we reduce uncertainty, or whether, whether we're willing to engage with and navigate and play with the world of uncertainty. Did I say certainty? You know, it's like this, this kind of um, closed versus open is, is a very simplified way of, of yeah. saying it. And then this aspect of surrender, where in in the realm of uncertainty, that's when this experience of uh, what I would call high mode surrender is mm. is is necessary. And some people would use the word the V word vulnerability. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, but all of that, that can only really come about either when you feel safe, or when you have a spiritual perspective that enables you to sort of lean into infinity, you know, something that's beyond the realm of the fixed. Yeah. Um, because as long as you're really identified with um, the little e ego, with um, your identity tied up with how much money you make, which again, we all fall into with how you look or don't look or you know, what, what any number of these other sort of go to identity factors that that reduces your capacity to surrender, to be open, yeah. to experience mm -hmm. vulnerability. 100%. And, and man, it's just like the, 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 the hierarchy, the the performance indicators, the best practices, the performance reviews, the you know, the just all these all these things they get so uh, I mean, in a way they function like, like parasites or like yep. vectors of parasites or something yep. to just suck your life force and your attention and your will and tank your desire to like yeah. bother. 
<laughs> well, in a way, what does certainty buy you is like a placation mm. of fear. If, if we're talking about the ego, right? You know, I desire certainty because I'm anxious about something, because I don't want the uncertainty, because I'm not comfortable with myself in the spaces between and my capacity to rise to whatever challenge I may or may not find tomorrow. And I think that's a big part of what we trade um, in, in exchange for, you know, participating in the systems. I mean, how many people do you know who will take a job that makes them five or $10,000 more a year, but cost them their life in their happiness and health. Maybe they're commuting two and a half hours, you know, a day. And that, I mean, that's immeasurable consequential cost, but the security that comes from knowing, okay, I have this, this money, or, you know, maybe I'll, I'll be feel more comfortable that my bills are being paid. You know, it's, it's the trade-off that we make. And these systems have promised us those things. And uh, quite honestly, in the last 20 years have started to fail us at those kind of things. <laughs> and so I think that's where a lot of people are starting to wake up to the, to the question of, well, what is better? What can we do? Like, how could we live in a better world? And that's where I got got inspired by uh, the Buckminster Fuller Institute because here people are talking about system thinking and design science and these like really pragmatic and practical ways to shift what we're doing and like you said not to argue with one another try and point the finger at this person or that person and motives and that all the other things but simply to just look and see, okay, here's what we're working with, and this isn't working. Like you said, you know, the cooperating manual being really near and dear to people's hearts, but does this work as we're doing it? Like, that's the question we should ask first. Is this working? <laughs> right. Yeah, no. And, and that, is this working? I mean, again, you have to be, you have to be open to a reality check. I'm um I'm a, a student of a lucid dreaming course through the Institute of Noetic Sciences right now, and um, cool. I love this I love this term reality check like when you're you, you you train yourself in the daytime and in your dreams to do reality checks you know try and put yep. your finger through the wall or see if you can levitate a little bit you know? <laughs> yeah man it's so cool when I can do that and I always think I'm awake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's something you said too reminded me. It's it's there's just there's such a profound level of of fooling oneself that happens. Yeah. And you know, it it's like it comes back to, you know, like if you if you if you conscientiously decide I'm going to as you said commute two and a half hours a day for this job that's going to pay me 10 or 20,000 dollars more a year than this other job that's maybe closer to home and or a nonprofit as opposed to a for profit or something. Yeah. It's like it's not so much about which job you chose as what was the spirit in which you chose in it. In which you, you chose know, was it. Was it yeah. a clear-eyed conscientious decision, you know, for a particular purpose or was it a oh yeah, well, hmm, you know, this kind of like I'm afraid that if slumber. I don't, that <laughs> I, this other yeah, job may go if, nowhere, if, and then I can't yeah. get the next job. Mm-hmm. Exactly, that kind of cyclical trap. Yeah, um, yeah, and and also I also wanted to mention, you know, from from so for for people who don't know the the cooperating manual for Spaceship Earth is kind of a spin on the title of a Buckminster Fuller book, the operating manual for Spaceship Earth. And there's this quote from the operating manual from Bucky that I really like because I feel like it opens up a whole potent area. This is from page 130 where he says, this all brings us to a realization of the enormous educational task which must be successfully accomplished right now in a hurry in order to convert man's spin dive toward oblivion into an intellectually mastered power pullout into safe and level flight of physical and metaphysical success, whereafter he may turn his spaceship Earth's occupancy into a universe exploring advantage. Yeah, <laughs> I love and that like, quote. Isn't that great? I mean, for me, it really speaks to his experience in the Navy and to yeah. his who knows what else, just perspective on 
isn't this awesome? We get to be alive on earth. And from here we get to then explore the universe or explore universe as he would mm-hmm. say. And, um, and for me that, you know, it, it kind of actually brings up my reference to, I've just had a long term appreciation for people who study other species who study, you know, who are in love with a particular bug or who are totally mm. devoted to sea otters or to a particular form of kelp or, you know, whatever it might be. And who are like, madly passionately in love with that with that organism and and then of course you know heartbroken as they see its life diminish on the earth but um yeah but there's something about that that universe exploring advantage statement and then that impulse to really deeply see into and understand what is that bug doing? <laughs> you know, like there's something, you know, or whether it's astronomers or whoever or whatever it might be, just that exploration impulse um, that I, you know, I would sort of agree with him is sort of at the center of the human experience. And yet if Absolutely. we've like burnt down the house, it's hard to kind of go out exploring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and again, yeah, when this, when when all this chaos is happening in the world, it's really hard for people to, or when you can't make ends meet, it's really hard to have that Maslow number three, where you're like, I'm going to look for meaning. Um, Maslow number four, it's, you know, you're just at survival. And, and that's keeping us trapped. It's keeping us spiraling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it really is. But, but also... I don't know, you know, I just there there's something about that, you know, just the the physical body's needs to to eat, to have shelter, you know, all these really basic, you know, as you mentioned, the the Maslow kind of thing. And I think it does get a little messy sometimes, you know, just like what really does come first, um, mm-hmm. because, you know, you see this, you see this in psychological disturbance, you see this in, you know, where it's like if somebody doesn't really have the, the spirit to get out of bed in the morning, you know, like yeah. maybe that's first before yeah. food in some way, shape or form. But, but even aside from that, I mean, the I really need for like, a hug. The need for a hug. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> we breakfast. just went through pandemic, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. all my friends who were single and living alone were really suffering. Yeah. Really badly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no. And, and at the same time, I feel like even so, also, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is is profound and really useful, a useful go to, because I think it helps make the case for human rights and yeah. for, you know, for universal basic human rights, as in yes. the United Nations, you know, declaration. Um, and I think that we again, it kind of brings us back to that question of purpose and um is the could we could it be the purpose of of maybe the human species or at least you know sort of techno western society to to maximize human potential to yeah um fulfill the universal declaration of human rights to you know could that could it could that be possible because then we can pursue our universe exploring impulse and and kind of without that we're we're consistently undermining what Bucky is, you know, the vision that he's putting forth consistently Mm -hmm. and diabolically. Mm -hmm. And also, as he points out, you know, the spin dive toward oblivion, potentially fatally and fatally, you know, and we're looking at that right now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's different perspectives on, on whether just the native North Americans and other indigenous people will be left or whether everybody's going to be gone or Mm -hmm. like there's different Mm -hmm. perspectives on what that, oblivion could potentially look like um and we spend lots and lots of money on vignettes in the form of movies and stories of what that could potentially look like right in the apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic but i you know and i enjoy those movies just like other people but i also i tend toward kind of the eckhart tolle sort of worldview or framework of um that consciousness is uh ongoing um, experiment mm-hmm. or process or, you know, something mm-hmm. and that the humans at the moment are, you were embodiments of that impulse and consciousness will continue. And, and yeah. as a species, we might completely fail and who knows what the outcome of that could be, but also consciousness is this ongoing 
you know, project. And so, um, yeah, it, 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 it seems more exciting and fun if humans, if we were to wake up and, you know, sort of reclaim the garden as it were, mm-hmm. um, like, Ooh, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it sort of takes the pressure off that perspective, you know, having that perspective. And I know not everyone has access to that perspective. I mean, there's real Mm -hmm. existential threat that's occurring. And, you know, for some people, it's hard to grasp the idea of consciousness existing beyond a singular body. However, um, we are looking at emergence intelligence within nature. I mean, we're looking at the networks of uh, mycelium that cause the trees to communicate with each other. I mean, life is pretty freaking mysterious, and uh, we don't know where consciousness comes from, and there's so much that is unknown, and actually I find hope in that because I feel like, you know, there, it, there are things that you just know that you can't know, like being in love. And that's such a part of the human experience. And so I think these grander, more beautiful parts of our human nature or, you know, our cosmic experience or however you want to put it, it's important because those are the values that beauty and love and poetry and art and all these things that we have, these ground us in our humanity. These ground us in the the good of what what we could make in the world these cause us to be more connected to one another and they encourage us to see things from a hopeful framework which like you said i mean if we're future casting about disaster all the time and we get to the point where we're so in the fetal position convinced that only disaster is possible then action is why would i take action to to solve this crisis that's inevitable anyway as a matter of fact you know why aren't i just going to look out for myself and try and you know hoard all the resources that i can to survive and that's what it always comes down to in these scenarios um i love i want to talk about your website life like honey um and i love that you quote uh the song it was actually by um i believe uh the writer was uh from i just learned this like from toto uh but for michael jackson's song man in the mirror uh you Mm, know you have to mm -hmm. look at yourself in the mirror it's the mirror principle if you want to make the world a better place you have to look at yourself and make a change and I think that's awesome that you go with that because for me, that's that's the re that's been the re-empowerment for me is like I can't control what's happening in the world. I can't I can't stop the polar ice caps from melting. And that's not my job. My job is to enhance my own growth and humanity to be a microcosm of a better world in my own life as best I can. And I'm going to do that imperfectly. But as I start to notice the opportunities I have to be a better person in the little world around me, that creates ripples. And going back to the cooperating manual, I had a, I had a mentor who said to me, we're talking about the problem of, you know, like uh, all these databases. And, you know, I, I was trying to build these systems in my business, you know, so, so things could work and people could interchange. And I had a mentor, uh, Wendy, Wendy Vanguard said to me, and she's run, run teams. She used to work for the Eames Institute. Um, she said to me, uh, Steve, the, the systems are the people. And I was like, what do you mean? If you have the right people, they contain everything that you need. And I'm like, oh, like you're right. Because I suddenly realized that that like as I'm interfacing with all these people through the um, space camp program, people there's all these walking libraries of information and and I'm learning not just from what they know, but I'm also learning from how they are. And as I'm connecting to that, I'm connecting to all this knowledge base of regenerative thinking, then when I go into my world with the people that I know in my everyday life, I am able to bring that that kind of awareness and the fact that some of those resources exist and if someone wants to know about, yeah, I'd like really like to get into some, uh, you know, regenerative um, projects working with the soil. I suddenly have heard about projects that are doing that. And I could be like, oh, hey, have you heard about ecosystem restorations camps? And they'd be like, no. <laughs> and I don't have to be personally spearheading anything related to that 
topic uh, or working on it or even super knowledgeable in it to make that connection. And so suddenly here I am in my community as someone who's learning a little bit about systems thinking and suddenly like applying that to myself in ways that are very illuminating for me. And it's it's like a whole new world. Like it's, it's so eye opening. And so I'm wondering about that component of people containing, you know, that's what also we're missing a regeneration pollination event right now, because I realized, oh, darn it, I scheduled this right, like in the middle of that. And that's like, kind of, you know, the purpose of just, well, if we're, if we're getting together, and we're conversing, and we're communicating, also another reason I'm doing the mission podcast, something that you set, something that you're about is going to spark someone else. And it's going to, it's going to ripple, it's going to connect. And so, yeah, we need, we need to, we need websites and databases and books and things that can, you know, outlive us and a sense but also i find out about those books because someone recommended them to me and so um i know i know i tangented on this whole other thing but also um to talk about your um hexagon and your life like honey uh, and just like how did how did like kind of integrate more pieces of of holistic living I, i'd love to to dive into both of those things yeah. So, so yes, the, the lifelikehoney.net website was born out of, um, the impulse you're, you're speaking to, which is, you know, the, the, the man or woman or them in the mirror where it's like, mm-hmm. I need to attend to my inner self. Um, and not only my inner self, but also like my, my life, my well being, And, I, I, I too, as you mentioned, you know, oh, you, somebody mentions about soil and I happen to know about this, this, and you know, so, so the website itself is meant to kind of serve or was meant to sort of serve as sort of a hub for that, that type of thing. And I say it was because I haven't attended to it in the last probably five years or so. It was mm-hmm. for me, it was a project when I was writing my dissertation and I really was, you know, I had been in classes for three years and then writing my dissertation and I really felt the the impulse to be contributing something specific of value to the world right now. Whereas Mm -hmm. I had been just basically at my desk, really just in my own studies for, for a long time. And so I, I followed that impulse and it turned into the, to the website, lifelikehoney.net where I just cataloged, you know, some of these things that had worked for me or that other people had mentioned had worked for them and, or that I had just heard about. And I kind of used this tiered system where the, the closest level into each, um, uh, side of the hexagon was something I had, I was personally familiar with and could highly recommend. And then the next level out, oh yes, yes. Thank you. The next level out, something that, um, you know, was either highly recommended by somebody close to me, or I had also experienced and highly recommended. And the third level out started to be more of the general, um, things I had heard about that might be useful to you. So check them out if you, if you feel like it. And, um, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, it, it was, I really actually enjoyed it. actually very useful. It was things I know, it was pretty useful. <laughs> things I know about, things that I, you know, things I really know about, things that I know of, and then things that I don't even know. Was that the three thing, the three layers? Kind of. Although when I got to the outer edges, it was things I was familiar with to some extent enough that I would take the time to put a link to them on here. Yeah. Um, you know, but... But yeah, so so something in that kind of tiered sort of way um, with yeah. the world of green and eco friendliness at the bottom and spirituality at the top and these others around the edges, um, because, you know, I've I'm a kind of a personal growth, not exactly junkie. <laughs> But I mean, I've you're spent getting a lot of your time in that world. doctorate <laughs> in uh, you're getting your doctorate in philosophy and uh, studying mythology. So, yeah, I, I yes. right up my alley. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I completed my dissertation in 2017 in the spring, and the title is um, "Spirituality." Let's see, sustainability and spirituality: common threads and common threats. And, mm-hmm. uh, what I did was I looked at, um, cause, and when I went into the PhD program at Pacifica, the mythology program, I went in with this idea for my dissertation and it ended up, you know, sticking mm-hmm. and I ended up writing mm-hmm. the dissertation on this topic, which was noticing over, you know, 15, 20 years of going to Bioneers conferences and being involved in various organizations and reading articles and books and all this, I had started to see patterns of, um, just topics really. Um, and principles. And I noticed through finding my own uh, uh, 
finding myself on a particular spiritual path and then other, you know, going to lots of different workshops of different spiritual schools and all this sort of a thing, these common themes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so uppermost would be like oneness or unity or interconnection. And so my dissertation was taking that topic and unpacking it and saying, okay, if I'm noticing a pattern of oneness, unity, or interconnection showing up both in the world of religious and spiritual traditions, and also what we call sustainability, then what's the evidence for that? And then just documenting that. Um, Awesome. But what I did is I paired them. So it was basically oneness versus fracturedness and um, purity versus pollution and Mm -hmm. um, living simply versus compulsive consumption and then care, heart and love versus antisocial tendencies. And then I had three other pairs that I included in the summary at the end because I was it was a 400 page dissertation with just those four main chapters. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, That's but anyway, great. I, I loved it. I had so much fun writing it. And um, I'm kind of looking for an excuse to focus on it and turn it into a book. And I just, you know, I haven't quite gotten around to that yet. But, I think it's um, important. I think it's important. I think I think a lot of people are starting to ask those questions and see that core uh, fundamental assumption as a flawed assumption. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult unless you've had a, you know, enlightenment experience to integrate the idea of oneness. But I think when you call it interconnectedness, it makes a lot more sense. It's like, you know, who are the people in your neighborhood? You know, like they're, you know, this, this, we're not in isolation. You can't, you can't live in a house without resources being brought by someone to that house. And you can't, you couldn't stay there like that. You're reliant on other people. So as you start to expand outward and, and see the truly rich interconnections that we can have with each other, you realize that we're all connected and to see things from that perspective gives you a much more positive and optimistic framework from which to build a world versus this idea of you know, separate, the ultimate separation being like the world is going to end, but I'm going to survive and screw everybody else because, you know, I've only got enough for me. And, and ultimately, you know, Eckhart Tolle talks about that. That's the madness that humanity has this idea of separation, this idea of, I am a separate self who is like completely alone and cut off and afraid. And it creates all these weird compulsions that we see. And so you're right in the sense, like, If, you know, like going back to the Bucky quote, you know, we have to, you know, we have to get the school to happen really fast. Ultimately, the more people we have who are able to live consciously, the more they're able to make a difference where they can make a difference and the more we can interconnect. And like you said, like stay outside of the snap judgments and understand there are causes that go beyond a single person, even if someone's being a butthead. Probably that buttheadedness came from their experience or their upbringing or somewhere. And I've seen people come around on some things that you would be surprised. And so I think to take that underlying fundamental assumption that like for me personally, it's like, well, I'm really no better than anyone else. I've been gifted a set of circumstances that made me like come out okay. And if I hadn't, it might have been that I wasn't. And yeah, there's a certain amount of like meanness that goes into how I interact with things. And that's not going to change. But ultimately, the part that is going to change is if I take a look at myself and if I decide to um, be the better me that I can be and not the better someone else, but the better me. And that's important because then it focuses my efforts on a larger sense of just than just myself because ultimately that better me is you know is better all the way around it's it's not it's not for me it's it's for it's it's because it's it's in harmony you know it's to create that feeling of of like fluidity and um confluence with you know the world around me and that is what creates happiness it's like if i like you said you know why are you choosing that job that's far away if it's for the right reasons then it could be the right thing and i just love that i love i love how spirituality even if you don't want to be dogmatic or religious about it that perspective of 
you know, and like you said, you can find it in, in ecology, you can find it in these different places, you can find it in permaculture, you can find it in just gardening. These experiences that are transcendent are that way for a reason. <laughs> they didn't just happen out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, you said something that I'm, I'm trying to remember, I wanted to make a point about, but it, it relates to this whole sort of interconnection piece. And it's, I feel like that's that's the beginning of systems thinking, and maybe it's all of systems thinking of just that experience of, um, you know, at multiple levels of cognition, experiencing the interconnections and or oneness mm -hmm. or unity. Like mm -hmm. that's that's um, there's a little piece about surrender there. There's probably a little piece about vulnerability, but it's it's the entry point to systems thinking. Um, I mean, you can wield systems thinking from a place of pushing your agenda. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been done and it's been done very effectively. Um, but really, when it comes to um, embodying the systems worldview, um, it, I think it really is ultimately a spiritual question. And I, I see over and over and over again that people drawn to the systems worldview do have some kind of significant spiritual reference in and for their lives. And yeah. um, it kind of comes naturally with the territory. Um, and yeah, so, um, but also just- And I would know, caveat to, that you don't have to believe in a deity to have yeah. that experience. Yeah, yeah, no, in fact, the meditation teacher that I studied with for a long time would point out the, the sort of downside of belief is that it can, depending on how you engage with belief, it can get in the way of experience because it preconditions what you are and aren't open to and yeah. um, can color your experience unnecessarily. The Tao that really. can be named is not the eternal Tao. Yeah, which which relates to Danella Meadows talking about the worldview level, the top level of her um, hierarchy, what I call her hierarchy of intervention, but that she calls, I think it's like leverage points for change or something like that. And um, mm -hmm. she talks about the worldview level being as being, first of all, the hardest to change, but second of all, the area with the greatest potential for change in a system. But then ultimately yeah. what we want to do is we want to be able to sort of put on different glasses or hats or worldviews, as it were, to, to, to put them on and take them off at will, to recognize that A, we have worldviews and B, we can be flexible with them. We don't have to be dogmatic about them. We don't have to believe in them in a fundamentalist way. And yeah. that's a whole nother level of freedom, ultimately, that is, it is far beyond the way we mostly think about freedom. <laughs> well, and putting on different hats in terms of different roles, like I'm going to put on the designer hat for a minute, look at it from that perspective on this project. And I'm going to put on the project manager hat on staying on time. And I'm going to, I'm going to put in the dreamer hat for a minute. I'm going to put in the uh the tech the technologist hat for a minute and if you can wear if you can trade these hats around you can start to interface better with the people on your team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because suddenly you can see that they're working from a perspective or a worldview that is helping them accomplish their role in this project and it's useful and needed and sometimes you got to take it off for a second to say oh yeah why are we doing this <laughs> like <laughs> i don't need to spend 12 hours on this one little button <laughs> you know or whatever um and I, I think that's brilliant. Um, there was something else that I wanted to share, um, but you know, there's it's just such a rich conversation, and there's so much more that I wanted to talk about that we can, you know, maybe loop back on another time. Uh, what's next for you, Felicia? Well, uncertainty <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of doing the normal looking for jobs on the internet and applying for the jobs on the internet. And I'm, I am interested potentially in like, um, one idea would be teaching mysticism at like a small progressive college. You know, I love, awesome. I'm really into mysticism, you know, in mm -hmm. my dissertation, I found that these principles of oneness and, um, living simply and all that they're embodied most passionately and vividly by the mystics, the seers, the, you know, the, the mystical tradition within world religions. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just like super fun and I love it. Um, so I would <laughs> love too. to sort of play in those waters more. Um, 
but also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at, I, I kind of like membership. Like I was working primarily in my part-time position at BFI in the membership realm. And I, you know, mm-hmm. it's a systems thing, you know, it, the power of the group and, and what, what, the, the potential richness of, of the, of the group of people that are passionate about something or a set of things and what they bring to the table as a group and, and what's possible from there. So I kind of like that. I also, you know, like you talked about working on a button for 12 hours, like I have that impulse, like I get, mm-hmm. I get really into the, the minutia because on the one hand, it's actually like somebody actually has to go into the database and figure out what went wrong and where and work on that. But on yeah. the other hand, too, I, I have that compulsive, like, you know, um, if the table is messy, I can't stop looking at it until I've cleaned it up kind of thing. Uh-huh. Um, so, <laughs> so I have that impulse, but, and sometimes um, you got to put on the hat where you're like, are we even building the right database? Should we stop? Well, you and know, build a actually I have a whole different one that someone already that. made. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I have this issue where I really, really, really want a three dimensional database and nobody has made one available to me off the shelf. And I'm very angry about that. <laughs> Cause I want to put on my, that might be Oculus a potential Rift zone of genius like, right walk there. into my database. <laughs> <laughs> do it oh, that would make me very happy <laughs> do it um, yeah i would just like do i have to learn python or like what do i have to become a, i'm not a programmer you know so oh, you're a team leader okay. you're a fantastic manager leader. and you've yeah, got you've thanks. got some serious organization skills and keeping people on task you could do this with help yeah yeah so i'll, yeah. I'll give more thought to to that that direction but um for the immediate term it's really just you know finish finishing i've never self-published a book before and so Having completed this, thank you, thank you, thank congratulations. You. This was a big lift. You know, I never 5th. knew that you had to. Yeah, you had to write an index as opposed to sort of magically generate one. Like, you know, <laughs> like indexes are a lot of work <laughs> to do a good <laughs> solid index. So I've had to learn all of those little pieces, and then you know, I and to write the index, you have to have finalized the page numbers, which has to do with the exactly. size of the paper. And yeah. the margins and yeah, all so that stuff. Yeah, typesetting. Mega changes after you've yeah. done your index. <laughs> Complexity. I think, you know, there's a reason why some of us are crotchety about the details because that, you know, stuff gets messed up when someone goes, hey, mm-hmm. I have an idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, all of the above and uncertainty. And I have a long standing interest in dreams. Like, I have my whole own dream database. That's what led me to do the PhD in mythological studies was this cool. sort of passion for dreams in the world of symbols and myth and all that. Um, so, at the, at the moment, who knows? But thank you for asking. <laughs> did you uh, did you listen to Della Burford talking about her work with Tenzin Rinpoche and the dream yoga? No, I'd love to listen to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and go check it out. It's it's the episode before. It's a couple episodes back uh, with Della Burford. Fantastic episode talking about spirituality. Um, I remember what it was that I was going to say, and this is a good thing to end on. I think your quote from Buckminster Fuller about the education component and the uh, awareness building component uh, for all the occupants of spaceship earth i think the space camp program has done a terrific job of introducing me and others to this whole new worldview this whole new perspective and it's so refreshing and it's so positive and there's so much potential and it's not just like pie in the skies it's like practical stuff and so that's why you know i've really gotten so much out of the work of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, especially the space camps. And I think, you know, the more people who are changed in these ways, um, deep down, you know, it's, it's, it shifts a lot of things and it, it, it means that you go through the rest of your life in a different way. And so mm-hmm. I want to, uh, thank you for your time at BFI and wish you uh, the very best of success and to whatever unknown becomes known and uh yeah this is wonderful to have you on the spaceship earth mission log check out my other podcast the language of creativity and uh of course you can get the spaceship earth mission log on substack if you want to subscribe via email or on itunes and also on youtube which is maybe where some of you are watching this and um yeah just any closing thoughts felicia before we go what I just want to acknowledge um, the work of Amanda Ravenhill and Faith Flanagan, who 
also yeah. in the past year left BFI, but they are the architects of the space camp program. And really they made it happen. They, for, from what I understand, they dreamt it up and they made it happen. And so I was very much a late comer and an inheritor of the, um, of the space camp program and just a participant really in the last go round where I met you. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really lovely to see the, to hear from you, your experience, having been around and been through some of the space camps and, and the, the experience of a number of the other participants. So hopefully BFI will continue the space camps, um, please, or something pretty please. equally it's or more amazing. It's changing the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing the world and it's boosting the membership. I keep telling people about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Both of those. Absolutely. Give and thank you the for, listeners. for inviting me on. Oh, yes, absolutely. Give the listeners your links, relevant links, and your, uh, if you do social media or, or LinkedIn mm-hmm. or anything like that, please give those. Yeah, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn. I don't have a special designated easy to remember URL, but generally speaking, systemsthinkingmarin.org is where most of my recent work has been. And feliciachavez.com to some extent, although I haven't updated that website recently, I will plan to update that as Dear Marin is made publicly available shortly. Um, but recently I have a lot of blogs on that re- pertain to Danella Meadows and this whole question of the purpose of the system is a jumping off point for a lot of the blog entries on systemsthinkingmarin.org. So that would be the main place. Excellent, where can people get your book? That also would be, um, if you go to systemsthinkingmarin.org, there's a page on there that pertains to Dear Marin. And it's, it's, I've decided, I self-published through Lulu because they're a B corporation from what I understand. And awesome. I could circumvent the Amazon thing. I mean, I'm going to do a audiobook and ebook, which will probably be on Amazon. But, um, but nevertheless, the paper printed book will be through Lulu. And so I'll have a link in the next week or so to, um, to be able to purchase the book itself um, as a paper book if you're interested. And then in the next few weeks, I'll have an ebook and an um, audiobook up. Most excellent. Felicia Chavez was my guest uh, for the mission, uh, the Cooperating Manual for Spaceship Earth. You can find the Cooperating Manual at spaceshipearth.live and look at many, many resources and uh, links that have been very lovingly curated, as well as you can check out the Buckminster Fuller Institute at bfi.org. I'm Stephen Levitt, and this is the Spaceship Earth Mission Log Podcast. Thanks for joining us.